My name is George Goulinet. I'm a PGY3 at Orlando Regional Medical Center in Orlando, Florida. And today I'm going to be presenting an abstract I did along with my mentors, Dr. Jay Ladd and Dr. Linda Papa. Our abstract is titled, Exhaled End Tidal Carbon Dioxide Measured Non-Invasively by Thymography at Triage is Associated with Shock Index in Patients Presenting to a Tertiary Care Emergency Department. Now, before I get into the abstract, there's two important concepts I'd like to cover first one of which is the shock index. This was first proposed as a measure of shock severity back in 1967. The shock index is a, a simple calculation taking into account patient's heart rate and dividing it by their systolic blood pressure. And what's been found is that the degree of shock is correlated with an increasing shock index value. And typically patients with a shock index value of greater than 0.9 have a significantly higher mortality oftentimes requiring pressors, blood products, and fluids. Now the utility of the shock index as a screening test for mortality and hyperlactatemia was validated by Berger in 2013. The study concluded that the shock, the shock index of greater than or equal to 0.7 was the most sensitive screening test for hyperlactatemia and 28-day mortality, and a shock index of greater than or equal to one was the most specific predictor. So we know that shock index has a utility uh, for predicting uh, mortality and hyperlactatemia. Now shifting gears to end tidal CO2, this is a continuous variable that's determined by three major components. A patient's basal metabolic rate, cardiac output, and ventilation. And an abnormal level in a patient's end tidal CO2 can reflect arrangements in perfusion, metabolism, or gas exchange. Take, for example, a patient that's in shock with metabolic acidosis. In those circumstances, a patient will try to compensate for their acidosis by blowing off carbon dioxide to try to bring down um, the amount of carbon dioxide in their system. Likewise, uh, in states of shock, there's less blood flow to the alveoli in the lungs, um, allowing less to be exchanged um, and thus driving down the end tidal CO2 level. And what we've seen is that there's an inversely proportionate relationship between end tidal and lactate, meaning as lactic acid levels rise in septic patients, the end tidal CO2 level drops. Now, what we wanted to do in this study is to see if there's any relationship between shock index and end tidal. Our main question was, is there an association between end tidal CO2 measured at ED triage in a patient's shock index and outcome. Now, the way we went about addressing this question is by a prospective observational study where we enrolled a convenient sample of adult patients presenting to the ED of our tertiary care center. Studies spanned over 30 months, uh, and what we did is we got, when patients got their initial vital signs and triage, we also measured an exhaled end tidal carbon dioxide level via Hypnography, which again is a non-invasive test for those who are not familiar. What it essentially involves is placing a nasal cannula on a patient's nose and having them exhale through their nostrils to get the level. Outcome measures, our primary outcome measures, included in-hospital mortality and ICU admission. Secondary outcomes that we looked at were if there was any correlation with end tidal and end shock index to laboratory measures of poor perfusion and acidosis such as serum lactate, sodium bicarb, and anion gap. The quality um, of end tidal CO2 and shock index to be able to predict our primary outcomes was determined by calculating the area under the ROC curve with 95% confidence intervals. Correlations were determined by calculating Spearman's row. Now getting into the results, overall we had 1,136 patients enrolled prospectively in our study. 1,090 had outcome data available. The average age was 56, 53% of our patients were male, 64 ended up being admitted to the ICU, and 25 experienced in-hospital mortality. Looking briefly at survivors versus non-survivors, the average end title for a survivor was 34, uh, and for non-survivors was 22. 
nobody, any, anyone that had suffered mortality, none, none of them had an end tidal above 26. In terms of shock index, the average shock index for survivors was 0.66 and non-survivors was 0.99. Now, looking at the correlation between end tidal CO2 and shock index, it probably doesn't really come as much of a surprise that there, there's an inverse relationship between the two. We found a row value of negative 0.16. Essentially what this all means is that as end tidal CO2 levels begin to decline in our septic patients, their shock index value will rise. Looking at our primary outcomes, uh, here we have plotted the ROC curves for predicting ICU admission. Well, one for end tidal CO2, one for shock index, and one showing the combined AUC of both. Uh, and to explain how to interpret this graph briefly, uh, typically uh, if a test has an AUC of 0.7 to 0.8, it's good. It's a good test, 0.8 to 0.9, it's, it's great, and, and 0.9 to 1, it's excellent. So just sort of grading the ability of the test to predict the outcome. Now, n CO2 had an AUC of 0.75, compared to shock index of 0.70. So n CO2 actually outperformed shock index in its ability to predict ICU admission. When combining the two, there wasn't really much added benefit or loss. Looking at our other primary outcome, in-hospital mortality, shock index did have an AUC above end titles at 0.86 to 0.82. But interestingly enough, uh, when you combine the two, the AUC was 0.90, which is quite good at predicting in-hospital mortality. Looking a little bit more into our secondary outcomes, overall end title actually correlated better with markers of acidosis than did the shock index, as demonstrated here by looking at the row values. To conclude, decreasing end tidal levels were significantly associated with increasing shock index scores. Again, as end tidal levels decline, our shock index scores begin to rise. End tidal CO2 correlated better with measures of acidosis than did the shock index. End tidal CO2 was a better predictor of ICU admission than shock index, and the combination of end tidal CO2 and shock index predicted mortality better than either of them could independently. And given the fact that end tidal is a quick and non invasive test, it has the potential to be used as a screening tool at triage for predicting mortality in ICU admission. It's a dynamic test, it's a continuous test. Uh, that can give you real-time uh, values to identify the status of your patient. I hope you enjoyed my talk, and I hope that you've stayed safe uh, during this time. And I thank you for your time. Thank you.